Hello everyone. Any great road trip, in my opinion, needs three key ingredients. You need good company, a great destination, and the right car. Now I'd like you to tell me what your ideal road trip is in the comments before you join me on mine. So what am I about to do? Okay, here's my three ingredients for the week, and it is gonna be a five day epic adventure as part of my three year anniversary celebrations here on the channel. So, ingredient number one, the company. Hi. The ever tolerable Mr. Dean. Ingredient number two, the fantastic, extraordinarily yellow, brand new Audi R8 V10 Performance kindly known to me by Audi UK. But the other part of my recipe was a little bit hard to think of. Where to go with that car and this ginger person? And it wasn't until we got chatting a couple of weeks ago and I realized there was somewhere very close that James had never been. And then I knew that was gonna be our destination. And welcome to beautiful, if very rainy, Scotland. We're here at our accommodation for the next couple of nights, the wonderful Nest Decker, which I can highly recommend if you want to have a little cool, funky place to stay up here. And it's now probably about time to show you around our wonderful car for the trip, because the title of this video is, Do We Need Supercars? And this is our supercar, so I guess I need to introduce you to properly. Well, the R8 is no doubt going to be a familiar car to most, and I would say that it's got a reputation as perhaps the usable supercar. Now, some people might say that's the most boring supercar, but there are a lot of times when you will be grateful for a car with some sort of all-round ability. The 600-mile journey to get here, for instance, and the very steep ramp down there that I know a lot of cars that would not get up, but we can get this thing up it, so that's pretty good. Now, to recap the basics of it, you've got a... 5.2 litre, 620 horsepower, or 612 brake, V10 engine in the back, driving all four wheels with a dual clutch S-Tronic gearbox. Now this car has a pretty sort of modest specification for a press car. The only real options on it are the red calipers on the ceramic brakes down here, um, and that's kind of it, nothing else, nothing else noteworthy in the car. No, the B&O, actually. The B&O is 
an option, which is probably the most expensive option on the car, at about 1,700 odd pounds. Now, there'll be plenty of you out there who are thinking that, well, how do you give me a lovely, nice, shiny supercar for a week, so I'm not gonna have anything bad to say about it. Actually, that's not in the least bit true. I have got quite a few issues with this car. And it's a very strange thing as well, because actually, most of my problems with this car are the sort of things that I would never expect Audi to get that wrong. It's simple stuff, like the fact that closing this door is much harder than it should be. Yeah, see, it just kind of doesn't want to shut properly. There you go, it shuts there. But about, I'd say, 20, 30 times on this trip, we've gone to close this door, and it's a pain in the ass. Uh, getting in it is not actually as simple as you might think. It does have these very nice bucket seats. Now, initially, uh, my co-pilot and I, that's James over there, right. <laughs> um, we weren't sure whether we like these or not. Now, you may notice that they are a little bit damp. And the reason they're a little bit damp is because when I was upstairs making our breakfast, <laughs> I sat on the key and wound the windows down. Yeah, it was what I did yesterday. Yep. And we got rained on. Yep. Um, now, as it happens also, even if you haven't been an utter idiot with the keys um, and drenched the interior of Audi's press car, when you open the door, a you huge amount of water will, will rain in upon the car, which is a bit annoying. Don't drive your drive supercar in the rain. Yeah. You might get wet. So, so that's annoying. So we're going to spend the morning drying out uh, Audi's car because I am grateful to them. Uh, storage is compromised in this car. Uh, your front storage area, you've got a huge front bonnet, which gives you all sorts of hope and wonder. And then you get this. And uh, as you can see, it's not even like... Not even that big. It's very small. We've got all sorts of crap in here at the minute, as you do when you're on a road trip. Um, and as you can see, the car has been thoroughly used. Um, I've tried cleaning it. We cleaned it the other day, and it's mucky again, so I apologise. But if you want pictures of a clean R8, I did take some earlier, so you can enjoy those. Um, it's even like shutting this is, is quite difficult, like especially if you're trying to do it one-handed with a camera in the other hand. Um, this is the new facelifted uh, V10 performance. The sort of big changes are a bit of styling tweaks, um, huge full width uh, rear grille at the back, which actually is kind of growing on me because it means you can see bits of the exhaust sort of through it, um, and a restyled front bumper, which annoys me because as I'm sure you've seen in plenty of other videos, uh, the, ven the, the, the venets, the vents they've added at the front are fake, as are the ones on the side, which is really, really weird because I mean, for a start, this thing gets roasting hot, like really, really, really seriously, seriously hot. The engine could really use a, a bit more vent. And also the side blades from the original car were like the thing that made the R8 so distinctive. So although I was never in love with them, they are a, a sort of thing of the R8, so to have lost those was a bit sad. Um, but overall, I do actually much prefer the styling of this generation over the original. I was never a huge fan of the original, actually for many different reasons, styling being just one of them. But then you get really nice stuff, like this, aluminium fuel filler which has also got no little sort of cover there which that's just really cool that's really really nice i had to use this quite a bit in the last week uh, coming up here the car actually got pretty decent fuel economy we got about 27 to the gallon which is very impressive for a, a big old car now the cabin in here the shape of it is actually pretty good um, first thing I noticed is the steering wheel, which I love. Audi seem to be doing some pretty decent steering wheels right now. Like, I really don't like BMW's wheels because they're all big, thick, and soft, which is horrible. This one, nice and thin, classic flat bolt, which is all very much an R8 trademark. Sadly, you'll notice that the exhaust button has disappeared from this car, and the exhaust system has gained a petrol particulate filter, which I'll talk about more later. Overall, the styling in here I do quite like. Um, what I don't like is the choice of materials. So you can see here, just under this small river, some of this kind of weird, like, diamond effect looking stuff, which is basically like the back of a gardening glove um, that someone sprayed matte. And there's, there's a real mix of stuff in here as well. Like, this is kind of flat, normal leather, but quite hard. Then you've got this weird material, which is like everywhere, and it's soft. It's not too bad to touch, but it just looks, it marks really easy. Really, really, really easy. Um, and it's, it's just not nice. Um, I would want much more leather in here, or even this being the super sporty car, like put some, um, just just put more leather or Alcantara or, or something in here. Now it is nice that Audi have finally started giving these cars carbon as standards. So you've got lots and lots of carbon everywhere, which is really quite nice. Not a big fan of this style of gear lever. That's that's not so cool. That's kind of um, annoying. Uh, wireless charging, um, USB ports, AUX port, and 12 volt socket down there. That's all pretty good. Connected connectivity is decent. Um, you've got a few drive modes. Uh, one of the things this car is not optioned with is Magnaride. So 
Again, I'll talk about that in the drive, but that does sort of render that kind of redundant. All of the modern R8s are S-Tronic gearbox only, and these paddles are just not good enough. It's as simple as that, not good enough. Now, the car has virtual cockpit. It also has a very loud cold start. Now, this virtual cockpit I had in the RS3, I started the week not really in love with it, and by the end of it, I kind of did. A lot of stuff in here is, is not at all intuitive. There you go, we've done, we've averaged 20.5 MPG over just over a thousand miles. Um, and that's me going to the shops this morning, got seven to the gallon. Um, 73 litre tank, you can get a larger optional one, which I would definitely uh, say to get, it's only 100 pounds, you can get a much bigger tank. Um, but stuff in here is generally where you want it. There's also some other auto emissions, like the fact that it's only single zone climate control. Um, there's some speakers in the headrests, which are silly because they're in the middle of your head, so they do basically nothing. And the B&O system in here, there, there's no two ways about it. Um, it's not very good. I mean, really, really, it's, 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 it's not at all. Now, I know normally, stuff like a supercar, the quality of a stereo and all that sort of stuff wouldn't be of any consequence. Like a lot of supercar owners I know, they never really turn the stereos on. But people are sort of using their supercars more. People do expect more refinement and things from them now. And the Audi in particular, the R8, because it is like the, the usable, the daily drivable supercar, the b &O system should be good. And it's pants. It's really front biased. It's totally lacking in mid-range. Um, for 1,700 quid that they charge, it's not good enough. So that that, that is a shame. Um, yeah, but yeah. You know, like you, you can have an Alcantara roof lining rather than a sort of weird fabric. But if you want an Alcantara diamond stitch roof lining, which would be nice and would really lift the cabin, it's two and a half grand. Um, interestingly, uh, I tried to get a price uh, sheet out of Audi, but they say they don't really do them anymore, which is a bit awkward for me being pressed. But I, I did manage to get one, and there was, once upon a time, an extended leather package, which I presume then covered everything in leather. But it's crossed out, so I don't know if they even offer it anymore. Um, and the other thing you may have noticed is the fact that this place is relentlessly black. Like, really, like, there's, there's just a little bit of, of yellow contrast stitching, uh, some yellow back seats and some yellow seat belts would just lift this interior so well. Because so much of it is fundamentally right, driving position is great, steering wheel is good, um, it, it, it's, it's got the basics there, but they just seem to be missing that attention to detail, which is really weird, because that's what would so typically, for me, characterise Audi. Um, so it's very odd, very odd indeed. But of course, this is a supercar and it's not all about where you put your luggage and you know how many different scents you can get out of the air conditioning. It's about the drive. So let's do some of that. Now, if you're thinking that the reason you'd bring a supercar somewhere like here is the fact that you can go absolutely bonkers and drive as fast as you like, well, I'm afraid you've missed that boat by about 15 years. There are plenty of speed cameras and policemen and restrictions and things around here, but that doesn't really curb your fun, or at least in my opinion, it shouldn't. You see, the reason I come up here is because it is absolutely breathtaking and the roads are good enough that you can enjoy them at a reasonable speed. The whole place is absolutely littered with sights like this. And after just a few miles in the Audi, although in reality I've now done about 750, a few of its key strengths do become very, very clear. The seating position in this is absolutely spot on. I've got a great view of the road, great view outside, and I've even got pretty decent rear visibility too, which isn't always a given in a supercar. And the only downside really is the fact that I can't actually see up very much, which around here is kind of nice to be able to do because there is so much to look at. And without a doubt, the highlight of the package is that mighty 5.2 litre direct injected V10 engine. I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever in my mind that that is one of the greatest power plants available on sale right now, if not ever. The few things that can improve upon it would be something like a Ferrari V12 or perhaps even an Aston Lump, but it really is a special thing. 
it pulls from 2000 RPM to almost 9 and it sounds pretty good too. However, in this 2019 model car, it just doesn't sound as good as it used to. I've seen a few people that have reviewed these and have said, no, nah, they still sound pretty good. And, and yes, they, they do sound decent. They're not a bad sounding engine, far from it. But they just aren't anywhere near as bombastic as they used to be. And that's really not Audi's fault. Like everybody else, they've now got to meet extra tight regulations, which include the fitment of a petrol particulate filter to cars such as this, and it has robbed the car of some much needed oral character. And that's a shame, because if you've driven the previous one like I have, that thing is just utterly bonkers, and to me, sound is a very big part of the supercar experience. The gearbox in this car is also absolutely spot on. Now the last R8 V10 that I drove was one of the lesser models, a 540 horsepower pre-facelift. And I'm told that the gearbox mapping is not the same between the regular and the plus or performance models. And I can believe that because this S-Tronic box is as sharp as any I've ever driven. In fact, I would genuinely say it is up there with the PDK box. And that's something I never ever say downshifts are instant they're quick but still smooth and this car's so nice to stretch out now the gear ratios are a little on the short side which isn't a bad thing because that means you can use that gearbox all the more often and when you get it over four and a half thousand rpm you just get a little bit more from that exhaust as well it pulls hard and savagely to about 8,000 RPM and it tails off just a little bit, but it will happily go to its 8,700 RPM red line. The view out is pretty cool too, although you don't really see any of that bonnet, but that is a common thing in a lot of supercars, so I'm not going to count that against the Audi. Now let's talk steering, shall we, because that is traditionally an Audi Achilles heel. I'm not going to pretend that it's brilliant because it simply isn't. Now this car has a standard, the variable ratio steering, which so many road testers do love to hate. And this is probably one of the best systems of that kind that I've driven, and in fairness this is probably one of the best steering VAG products in general that I've driven in quite some time. In fact, the only thing that's really markedly better than it was the delightful RS2 that I drove a couple of weeks ago, but that really is in a different league and comes from a very different time. The steering's so odd because it's actually very direct and it does precisely what you tell it to. When you get it up to speed and if you put it in performance mode, it'll lock itself to its quickest ratio too. So it's not kind of changing itself on you, which I think is the source of some frustration with the earlier systems. And it feels great. You do this kind of thing, the car does precisely what you tell it to. But what it's missing is that vital element of return communication. This is a one-way conversation that I'm having with the car steering and that's just a shame. And whatever method Audi used to steer their cars, there is no excuse because Porsche have been using electric steering for a good few years now and theirs is absolutely brilliant and I would say pretty much up there with some of the best of the old hydraulic systems. And I don't see why Audi can't just give this to Porsche for 10 minutes and get some steering out of it because if they did that would really resolve one of the car's major dynamic flaws. I know that the all-wheel drive system can't be responsible for robbing the car a steering feel because Porsche doing an all-wheel drive 911 and that's got plenty of it so it really is a bit of a mystery to me how they can have made this car for so long and just still not have got that quite right. All-wheel drive though, for driving a road like this in mixed conditions does really give you a level of confidence that you might not have in something else. If I was taking, let's say, a McLaren 570S down a road like this, I would probably be a lot more cautious because I know the car's got a lot more torque, it's going to be delivered in a slightly spikier fashion, not this beautiful, linear, naturally aspirated way, and it's only driving the two rear wheels, so you're going to be just a little bit more conscious of the car's ability to step out on you this thing not at all it really hasn't been unruffled whatsoever now yesterday we drove this on some very tight technical complicated roads that I best describe as Lotus roads and we were chasing a series one at least piloted by a British auto test champion who was well 
driving it in a spirited fashion, shall we say. And the Audi was certainly not faster, but it did an admirable job of keeping up. And anybody that's followed a well-driven Series 1 Elise in anything will know just how hard that is to do, especially when they're on essentially their home turf. This car, bizarrely for a press car, is missing the all-important adaptive damper, so it's got the standard sport suspension. It still confuses the hell out of me as to why Audi chose to omit that from the spec sheet on these cars, when everyone knows how important it was for people buying the first generation R8. Very strange indeed. There's just no doubting this car's firepower though, it's unreal. And for these lumpier, bumpier sections, that sport suspension actually does a really good job of keeping this car's mass in check. With two of us in here full of whiskey and porridge, this car's going to weigh about 1.9 tonnes, and it's doing a very good job of keeping everything under control. The only bit really missing, as mentioned, is that steering, which doesn't really tell you quite how close to the edge you're getting, and so I haven't experienced any understeer yet, but you're just always conscious of how easily it might happen, particularly when you've got portions of the road surface that are a little bit slick, a little bit broken, and so on. I've had the tyres lock up a couple of times under braking, just, just for a fraction of a second, but when they start skipping and bouncing off the road, they've, they've got nothing to grip on, so that, of course, is going to happen. The R8's other dynamic failing is the carbon brakes, standard on the performance model. They certainly stop the car well, but at cruising speeds and around town they are needlessly grabby, something I've not experienced on any other Audi and another curious oversight. In truth, I think my biggest mistake about the car I chose to bring up here was the fact that I asked for the coupe, when I really, really should have got the Spider. I've driven the old 540 horsepower Spider before, and I was actually quite impressed with how little that seemed compromised. It still went pretty quickly, and the body still seemed very, very well controlled indeed. And you can tell from driving this just how good the chassis is. And that is the end of our Scottish adventure. It is as it has been for the last four days, raining. <laughs> and we are currently here Pretty in the... continuously. Yes. We're currently here in the wonderful Nestecca with our fabulous Vegas Yellow R8 parked outside. And we've now had the best part of 1,600 miles and four days to ponder the question, do we still need supercars? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah. And the truth is that we certainly haven't saved any fuel by doing the trip in an R8. Though, though fuel has been reasonable. Fuel has been much better than we anticipated. Yeah, it's not yeah. bad at all. Yeah. What did we get on the way up? 27? 27 to the gallon on yeah, the way up. that's not bad for that kind of... And like, as we were saying on the way here, I don't know if it's got any particular special fuel saving... No. You wouldn't need... I know people always... Every time I see this mentioned in a forum where people talk about things with these cars, like fuel economy and so on and so forth, people go, oh, well, if you've got to worry about that, you can't afford it. Actually, these things do make a big difference, especially as most people are buying these cars on a monthly sort of payment plan. So, you know, whether it costs you 200 quid more a month to run it, that, it is, that is significant. And it's also a bollock ache constantly going to the, the, the petrol station. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so we haven't really gotten anywhere any faster by having the R8 mm -hmm. at all. No. I'm pretty respectful of the speed limits and everything everywhere, yeah. um, and you're still having plenty of fun. Yep. But the big question for me is: Has bringing a supercar on this trip improved the experience? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Just um, from the reactions and people yeah. that we've met and conversations and. It's the it, the funny thing is actually the the best bit about the car, and I've actually, I would still not say I'm in love with the R8. Mm. It has grown on me. I have bonded with that particular car a lot. Um, and if it's I... taken a while as well. It's not. It's not been. An... I mean, I, no. to be honest, the first day it was like, "This is wrong. That's wrong. Don't like this. This isn't great. That's not great. This isn't good enough." Yeah, neither of us loved the car on day one. No, no, not in the least. I was no glad to have it. Thank you, Audi. But like, it's quite. It's quite. It's actually been quite odd because for an Audi, you would have thought that all the boring stuff would be the stuff that it did quite well. Yeah, and it didn't. It's done everything a bit arse about face that car. 
Yeah. Which doesn't make sense for an Audi. Like, uh, you, it, but it is quite a supercar, isn't it? Yeah. It's doing but, stuff. But it does, but again, strange and German here called at the same yeah. time. But. Very strange. Um, but the number of people that have talked to us about the car, the number of people taking pictures Colour. of it. Again, it's so susceptible to that. Again, if it, if it had been grey, I don't think you'd have the same. No. It's been, it'd have blended in. Supercars should always be bright colours. Yeah, they need I think. Be, they need, yeah, yeah, it's, stupid. it's a bold statement. And the thing is that. I know there's a lot of people out there, and probably including some people watching, that think a supercar is just some sort of like hideous, peacocking kind of, you know, show of wealth or whatever. And maybe that's what it is for some people. Definitely for some people. Yeah. But actually, on this trip, we found nothing but admiration for people. And I think the R rate. Like he's, yeah, I was going to say, I haven't been a Lotus yeah. owner, having known what the kind of love you can get from people, knowing how much grief you can get from owning other vehicles. I'm surprised at how many people like the R8. Like, we haven't had any grief, nothing but positivity in it, which is mm. quite peculiar, which is worth its weight in gold in itself, almost. Oh, yeah, I think, actually, maybe <laughs> we're both big Marvel movie fans, and I think, genuinely, the Marvel effect actually is, yeah. is quite real, like... A lot of the kids love it because you know Iron Man had yeah. one or whatever, and like so. I think actually for for younger people, when they think supercar, they well, do actually think R eight. Iron Man that ate all the pies. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> um, but yeah, so actually it's been a really really good time, and I'm going to be really sad when the car goes back. Yeah, we actually sent it the way back, didn't we? Yeah. Like, actually, yeah. I'm quite gutted to see the car go. Actually bonded with it um, yeah. and really really enjoyed it in the end. Um, it has been a car that's taken a long time to show its strengths. And that's what I say, anyone that is genuinely and seriously considering buying one, you can't do it in an hour's test drive with that car. No. I think again, if you're used to a TTRS or used to an S3 or an RS3 or an M2 or mm. whatever the Pick your flavour of the car at that level. Um, I think you see. I think even if you had say like an RS6, it wouldn't make sense at first. But an RS6 is just uh, it would be no different on the trip that we've well, just it's done. A taxi that just drinks a lot of fuel. Yeah, but I mean, like performance-wise, sorry, like, mm. you wouldn't necessarily notice any. Di it's not like oh, I'm going to get the RS. It's going to be so much better than the RS6, for instance. You know. No, don't um, buy for that. Don't buy for the no, speed. But, or no, no, else. it's not. I, I don't think you can get it in an hour. Unless no. you've had that sort of, if you're used to other cars of hype, like if you've had a 911 into that, you actually might find it's not what you would expect initially. Mm. Um, it takes time. It's not something you can make a decision, I think, in an hour's test drive. No. The salesman sat next to you. But, and I have said before, that I'll be very honest about everything, and that includes cars handed to me by manufacturers. I can't actually recommend that anybody buys one of them. Because what you really want to buy is the pre facelift mm. one, yeah. which is better looking because it has less fake stuff on it. Mm -hmm. Sounds way better. Much, ha having just, driven, yeah. yeah, I've nearly bought an R8 on two or three yeah. occasions. They're bombastic. Uh, they are screamy, shouty, angry. Yeah, and that's big part of supercar. Yeah. Big part of supercar it's a drama. for me. Yeah, big yeah. time. Um, and all the good stuff that really has, it has. It's both Everything. the same thing anyway. Yeah. Um, there's, everything nothing, else is there's not an option you can have on this that you couldn't have on the previous. I In think fact, it's the opposite. I think you can have more on the yeah. last one. And there's like laser lights, I presume, is all on the previous one. Uh, the, the, the first generation already had laser lights. Oh, well, the there LMX. You go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So, so, there's nothing particularly, and I know it sounds cruel because, like you say, Audi gave you the car, but save yourself like 60 a lot grand of money. and go and buy a used one. Like, I've seen a few people put up um, the old pre facelift. V10 Plus, which is essentially what that car yeah, is, minus yeah. 10 horsepower, which is nothing you're never going to notice. And again, it. with the particular filter in there, that robs at least probably 5 horsepower anyway, from what I've read. Maybe, but no, no one's going to notice it, but you do notice the, the sound. That's it, yeah. Um, and, well, say performance-wise, yeah. what I'm saying is the 10 they've given yeah. you has probably been subtracted by the particular filter yeah. anyway. And, but I, don't um, think it, I think if you straight line the pair, buy the buy used one. Yeah, I mean, un unreasonably Same 60 good. grand. Yeah, yeah. And an unreasonably good value for money. Then all of a sudden, to me, the car then makes sense. Yeah. Complete sense. I mean, like, it's like, oh yeah, it's a bargain now. It's actually yeah. ridiculous. Ninety five grand, which you can pick one up oh, for. Less like, than that. Yeah, Easy. all day long. Yeah. yeah, then it is like an absolute bargain and century because you can't pick up a what would you what would even be remotely as exotic as that? Like mid engine, naturally aspirated car. There isn't really four five eight, and I personally, you know mine. Yep. Of all the Ferraris. Yeah, it's 458. Like driven I've never driven one. If you've got a 458 that I can drive. Yeah, but anyway, that thing's saying seven and a half minutes, which is our, which is more than enough for our conclusion. Oh, right, okay. But right. basically, short answer, yes, we do need supercars still yep. because 
Oh, well, they make other cars better anyway, because you can use them for R&D and stuff. Well, are they, are we going to talk about the bit about the whole, like, how cars have changed, as in, like, years ago, if you bought a supercar, it was genuinely quicker than anything else on the road, whereas now it's become much of a smaller gap. Is that in another video? We could do that in another video. Oh, we'll do that in another video. Um, Which is it's actually a valid point. It is a valid point. The, the, the need is technically less for one now than ever, but I think they've never been about rational decisions and actually maybe one of the big things as well people kind of i think actually gloss over it or ignore it supercars inspire people to drive mm -hmm. like force or do other things that that does make me want to get in and drive it purely for the engine if nothing yeah. else if the engine is just ridiculously awesome yeah and it, it, inspiring people is important mm. make that car makes people happy yeah yeah I, well, that's what i said i've not we've not had one bit of grief in it have we nothing no People love random people in the street, like tourists, mm. are taking pictures of the car in the street. The car is making people happy and and smile a lot, and they yeah. wave at you, and they talk to you, and there's no. And in the day and age of like cars are evil, the internal but, combustion yeah. engine must go, and all that stuff. Like actually, just putting a smile on someone's face. It's quite nice. It is actually there is something to that. I know it sounds ridiculous, but actually, the, the, you have to drive these things in the public. You haven't got your own private race course you can go on. You have to interact, and it's. It's actually quite nice. Yeah. Own a supercar, take it out, be cool to people. And use it. And use it. Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks to James for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed this and you're currently enjoying this lovely big month of celebration that I've got. See you for the next one. Bye bye. Da -da. Da -da. <laughs> big old udders. <laughs> Swinging around. This is quite a nuisance actually. <laughs> I couldn't part with this shit. <laughs>